Hello, and welcome to Mapping the College Edition, a podcast where we explore the landscape of the college theater world and try to demystify this daunting audition process. I am your host, Charlie Murphy, director of MTCA. That's musical theater, college auditions, and today we have got a soaking wet piece of granite lined up for you. Aaron Galligan Stirl from Slippery Rock University is on the podcast, and we had a really engaging conversation, if I do say so myself. Uh, Slippery Rock is another great example of a new program, very new program, trying to do some really exciting things, and I'm excited for you to hear about them. But before that, happy June, happy Pride, my beautiful listeners. Um, Our family has been enjoying the weather, which has necessitated some fun summer fashion for Solvi. It's been very enjoyable if you follow us on the Instas. Um, We're gearing up for a few fun things ahead. As I warned earlier, we are going to take a short podcast break after next week's episode, which is with the amazing Jesse Mueller. Fear not, however, we will be recording ahead. We have lots of exciting guests, both scheduled and recorded already, including a couple of other Broadway powerhouses. And the timing could not be better for Jesse's episode, who of course was the OG star of Waitress, given that next week we are finally going to get to see Solvay in her starring role in the filmed version of the Broadway show. Uh, Elizabeth and I are going to the premiere at Tribeca on Monday, And I don't really know anything else about when it'll be publicly available or really anything much about the movie, Um, but we're really excited to to see it. And uh, we'll try to find out if we can get any uh, uh, information of when it's going to be released or how you'll be able to see it. So you can all enjoy the 30 seconds of my baby in the film, as well as the other amazing cast. To my MTCA class of 2024, I just want to see, did you all check your email? We'll talk about checking your email with Aaron a bit. Um, Did you see that we released the individual class registration for the Summer Faculty Masterclass Week? The all-week discount is gone, but you can still register for all the classes if you would like, or pick your favorite few, however you want to do this. However, I will say this event will likely sell out soon that's how it's looking right now that it's going to sell out so don't wait if you want know you want to attend it should be a super fun event you'll be getting more information in your email about the broadway show we're all going to special q a's other bonus events for you throughout the week you can register for those bonus events individually or they're included complimentary if you register for all the classes okay that's enough of that let's get to aaron galligan sterl of slippery rock university Well, we are so excited to be joined by Aaron Galligan Sterl. Uh, Aaron holds a BFA in musical theater from Shenandoah University and an MFA in acting from Penn State University. He's been on Broadway in The Phantom of the Opera, Ragtime, Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Um, he was a seven year company member at the Utah Shakespeare Company. Uh, lots of directing credits as well. Um, and Slippery Rock University is in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. They're shooting for class size of around 14, and we'll chat a little bit about class size for a newer program. Uh, and they offer BFAs in music theater and acting. Aaron, welcome on the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. We are excited to have you. So I gave you that little bio, but anything else that you want to catch us up on in terms of your journey to Slippery Rock and how you got here and any fun paths along the way? Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, I was... a. Uh, um... I went, as you mentioned, I, I trained and then I went to New York City and I lived in New York City for about 20 years. And during that time, uh, I did all of the jobs you said, as well as many, many more. Um, mm-hmm. And at the same time, I was also uh, doing a couple other jobs. I was working both. I was working as a professional audition coach in New York City and built up a, my own studio and my business uh, with that. And that was really uh, taking off and doing wonderfully. And then I was also working as a showcase consultant. So I was mm-hmm. going around to a lot of universities and I was uh, helping them uh, bring their seniors to New York City. We can talk a little bit about the lessons that I learned from that. And uh, can't uh, wait to talk about showcase. Yes. <laughs> and then the pandemic hit. And in the midst of the pandemic, um, uh, all work completely dried up. And um, I was uh, out of work for about six months. And mm-hmm. I got an email literally uh, kind of out of the blue saying that they needed it, it was it was in July saying that mm-hmm. they needed somebody starting in August to uh, do a, a one year virtual all over Zoom college professor job at Slippery mm-hmm. Rock University. I was like, well, I've never heard of Slippery Rock, um, but man, I could use the job. I'm happy to do this for mm-hmm. a year and then, you know, move on with my life back to my you know life in New York City, teaching and coaching and acting and directing. 
And I did it for uh, those nine months. And at the end of the nine months, a couple different things happened. One, um, I utterly fell in love with the students and the faculty mm. at Slippery Rock, just fell in love with them. Simultaneously, um, my wife uh, said, hey, Aaron, what do you think about... Um, you know, our kids not sleeping in a one bedroom anymore and having a little bit of space and, you know, being able to ride their bikes in a, in a neighborhood. And I went, wow, that does sound really, really good. And then at the same time, uh, Slippery Rock asked me to apply for the tenure track position to uh, run the musical theater program. Uh -huh. And in the midst of all those things, it just felt like the right move. And man, I have not looked back since. It's thrilling to be here. Truly kismet. And boy, we're having those. We have a two-year-old right now. We're about to be a two-year-old. We're having all those conversations going, what is it <laughs> going to be like in Harlem and whatever, and just growing up and where yep. do you ride your bike and all those yep. things. And and I'm from Pittsburgh, so Slippery Rock. We know it. Piss slippery Rock, of course. We know oh, where yeah. it is. Yeah, not um, far at all. Not far at all, yeah. Um, all right, but so now in your experience, now as um, you know, running the MT program, but also just from the virtual experience, those Slippery Rock students that you fell in love with, what made you fall in love with them? What makes them different than every other young student who's interested in musical theater at different colleges? Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a number of different things that I, I just love about them. The first one is that, you know, as an audition coach, uh, it was so transactional, right? It was, uh, my job was to come in and, and work on one specific piece with somebody and help them book that Broadway show and then move on. And what's, I'm just finding so thrilling. Uh, I'm not answering your question exactly. I'm answering sort of why I love it. And then I'll tell you why the, the students are wonderful. What I love is, is the long term, right? The growth that happens over a semester, over multiple semesters, over four years, right? To, to be able to incrementally work with someone on developing their technique and, and who they are, it's just a thrilling experience for me. Mm -hmm. So that's what I love about the, the shift to this, to this position. What's specific about the students at Slippery Rock is that you know, they are a group of really amazing, unique humans. Um, they are they are hungry. They are passionate. Um, they have an entrepreneurial spirit and and a, and a willingness to to figure it out with us, um, and a, and a great sense of generosity and kindness. Mm -hmm. And all of those things together make for a wonderfully rich environment of people who are hungry to grow. Mm -hmm. And that's all that I could possibly want is, you know, show up every day and have people who are there who's who are ready to work and ready to grow. That mm -hmm. that sounds thrilling to me and, and has been. I love it. And when you talk about that longer term growth, uh, I'd love to hear about, you know, what are the four years, both in terms of what is the curriculum currently of freshman through senior year, but then also if there are any changes now in your sort of newer position of going, how are we going to shift the curriculum? I'd just love to hear what it is and, and what you think it might change into over the course of the next couple of years. Yeah. So the first thing that's worth starting by, by sort of clarifying is that we are a brand new BFA. Mm -hmm brand new, right? So the Slippery Rock had a BA theater program for 50 years and has a long tradition of, of training wonderful artists. But the BFA, which is really what I've been working with and that we're really, uh, is, is really developing, um, is, is brand new. Mm -hmm. And we, we literally just graduated our first senior class this, this May. Mm -hmm. um, so we're four years in. I've only been there three years, two of which I've been head of MT. Uh -huh. Right. So we're, we're really at the very beginning of the trajectory. And, and what I love about that is that um, not only have we already made an enormous amount of progress and, and change and growth in the in the short time that I've been there, but I really do see us at the very, very beginning of a, of a long trajectory of growth and development and, mm -hmm. and strengthening. Um, and so, you know, anytime I do one of these podcasts, I always say, well, this is how it is today, right. fall of twenty or I guess, you know, how it will be in fall of 2023. But the reality is a year from now, four years from now, 10 years from now, we're going to have to do this podcast again because so much has changed, of course, right? right? Um, that being said, here, here's sort of the, the framework. The, the most important thing to know is that um, what we have is a BFA in acting with two different concentrations, a concentration in musical theater or a mm -hmm. concentration in acting. Mm -hmm. And the reason we do it that way is because we really center acting as the, as the core of everything else that we do. We really let that be the, the way in to the singing, to the acting, to the dancing, to the um, uh, auditioning skills, to the film and television, right? We use that as sort of the, the way in and we have a, a rigorous and very specific pedagogical approach 
to help develop authentic, unique artists. You're going to hear me say that phrase probably a number of times. And Mm -hmm. it really centers in that acting core. And so in your first four semesters, you're going to take acting one through four, acting one, two, and three are each a different technique. We do that specifically so that you have a deep dive into three different techniques in your first three semesters. Each one is complementary, but also contrasting Mm -hmm. and allows you to start building your own personal uh, artistic tool belt that you're going to be able to use for everything else that you do at Slippery Rock. That fourth semester, that acting four, is a scene study class where we use it as a lab, where basically the professor goes, cool. Now you learn this, 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 Mm -hmm. all these different techniques. How do we mix and match? How do we find the things that work for you? How do we throw away the things that aren't working for you? And how do we apply it, right? Mm -hmm. So that ends up being really the core of everything that gets gets us started. We then have um, uh, a number of additional acting techniques that rotate through for your junior and senior year. And you get that to use that those as potential electives. They're not required in either of the curriculums, but you get to go. Oh, I'd like to. I'd like to learn that technique. I'd like uh-huh. to learn this specialty. And you can continue growing the acting technique from there. And while we're talking techniques, give me a couple examples. Like what? What would three different techniques, or maybe some of those supplemental bonus techniques? What do they look like? Um, you know, are we talking about Meisner. Are we talking about what kind of stuff are yep. you going? Yep. Oh, this is uh, an option for me. So acting one is sort of a. Um, it, it rotates between sort of a Stanislav based sort of traditional um, objectives, uh, actions, Mm -hmm. tactics, approach, and and sometimes uh, zeroes in on practical aesthetics sometimes, Mm -hmm. sort of depends on who's teaching it, but it's really an entrance into sort of the the traditional uh, methodologies there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Acting two is Uta Hagen technique. Acting three is Meisner technique. Uh And we do that for the first three. And then the rotation really depends on uh, a lot of different factors. We sometimes do, um, we do uh, things like um, Michael Chekhov technique, Mm -hmm. um, or we'll do a film, a semester of film and television technique, Mm -hmm. or we'll do a semester of um, uh, styles technique, like something related Uh to period movement or Renaissance styles or, or, or Shakespeare, right? We'll do different things there that then that our students can continue to grow with. Totally makes sense. All right. Yeah. And now what if I am that MT um, of the branch of the acting? What else am I going to get beyond just the, the acting training? Yeah, absolutely. So um, essentially, there's a whole, I'll, I'll kind of go through each of the curriculum. So essentially, we have our uh, views, voice and music training. And the way we do that is that your very first semester, you are in a class voice class, a group class voice class. So that's very intentional. We use that to really pedagogically set all of the different things about physiology, anatomy, breath support, make sure mm-hmm. everybody's on the same base for that really important training for sustainability and health, right? Mm-hmm. We then start your private voice lessons starting that second semester of your freshman year, and you continue that through the end of your first semester of your senior year. The final semester of your senior year, we do something really unique, or we will be doing something really unique. We actually mm-hmm. haven't started it yet because um, the curriculum has just shifted to include this, which is that what we're going to be doing is we're going to be pairing our students with professional voice teachers out in the city that they are headed to Mm -hmm. so that they can start creating that relationship and that community before they even get there. That's going to be part of our situation as we work to, uh, to help launch them. And we say pairing, we'll talk about cost, but is that included, is the pairing included as part of your tuition or is that now an additional cost? I'm, I'm just meeting this person who I'll work with privately. It's a great question. So all of the voice lessons are all completely included in the cost. The, the, the final semester, that is in addition. And mm-hmm. it is, uh, and that being said, we are negotiating uh, very discounted rates for our students uh, uh-huh. with each of those people uh, to, to create those relationships. And hopefully they keep those discounted rates after they graduate. That's the dream, right? That when, is the when, dream. When that's that. exactly the dream. Exactly. <laughs> we also have we also have musicianship classes that happen in, the, in that first year to make sure that they have... Um, uh, music theory and oral skills and sight singing that also happens in your first two semesters. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that sort of is the, the, the vocal component. Yep. Um, we then have what we call sort of our musical theater component. And the musical theater component basically is that, uh, starting in that, after you finish the first two techniques of the music of the acting techniques in your first semester, sophomore year, uh, you start into a uh, musical theater song repertoire where we work on solo song performance. Then we do a full semester, the second semester of sophomore year of pop rock 
song mm-hmm. repertoire. Make sure that you have both the vocal and acting techniques necessary to do pop rock. As we know, that's an enormous part of the industry at this point. Mm-hmm. Then in your junior year, you're doing acting for song one and two, which is um, our uh, scene study classes for musical theater. Uh, and then we move into auditioning for musical theater. And then, of course, the senior showcase. And that's mm-hmm. a part of, of the, the musical theater trajectory. Um, then we have our dance trajectory. And basically, this is something that I'm really, really proud of. Um, we, we really feel like access and uh, equity are extraordinarily important when we're talking about dance. And we recognize that a huge number of students who are extraordinarily talented mm-hmm. have not had the resources necessary to train um, to be to be competitive in the dance arena. Mm-hmm. And so what we have done very, very creatively, I feel really proud of this, is that first of all, there is no dance comport. Um, component to the audition process for Slippery Rock. Um, If you come in with an extraordinary amount of dance, we're going to take care of that. But it's not a requirement. And so people Mm -hmm. can come in at literally any level of dance. Then what we do is in that first semester, every single musical theater major takes the same dance course called Experiencing Dance, which is sort of our way of talking about how dance tells story and Mm -hmm. how we use those acting techniques and thread them through movement. In that course, we then level our students And starting in that second semester freshman year, our students can enter into whatever dance level that they are ready for Mm -hmm. with our sister department, which is the dance department, which is a nationally ranked dance department. Mm -hmm. So we have students who come in who've never taken a dance class and immediately go into a ballet one. Mm -hmm. Um, We have students who come in with uh, extraordinary amount of of, uh, competitive dance and they can go right to jazz six if they are ready for Mm -hmm. it, right? Um, And I feel really proud of that because it really does serve all of our students and allows for equity, um, which is so important to us. I love it. Yeah. And then as an actor, if or if I'm sort of, I'm actor, but I like singing and dancing, I think I might eventually want to do musicals. What is available to me as a BFA acting major at Silver Rock? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, the, the brilliance is that basically the way we do it is that we have a lot of crossover between our BFA actors and our MTs. Um, they're all eligible for all shows. Um, they end up taking a number of the classes uh, together. So they mm-hmm. form a cohort and are working together. And then essentially the way we do it is that um, for each of those sort of musical theater specialized classes that I described, our BFA actors or our BA actors or, or anyone in the school, honestly, um, uh, this last semester we had someone who's a music education major who did mm-hmm. this. Um, you're allowed to audition for that specific class. Uh-huh. And as long as the person has the requisite skills to succeed, we're, we let them in. We want yeah. you to get that training and that experience. And so we have a number of our students in both programs taking courses in the other program as long as they have the requisite skills. And if they don't, we help them get them, right? So I had a student come and audition for one of the acting acting uh, musical theater so- classes. And I said, you're not quite a strong enough musician. Go take these musicianship courses uh-huh. and come back. Right. And so we let them into that and then they can come back and audition again and, and then and get to take some of those classes. It's really cool. Um, now, what about outside of the musical theater acting world? Yeah. What do I get at Slippery Rock and that goes beyond this the artistic theater stuff? Yeah, so I'll, I, I, I do want to actually, before I move to that, round out the, the, the rest of the... the There's the more? How could there course, be more? Please, I know, give right? me more. I, know. I just want to point out a couple highlights. And a couple of those are that we do, a, we do a film and television class. That feels really important to us. And here's maybe the thing I'm, I'm most proud of, is that your very first semester that you are at Slippy Rock, you take a wellness for the actor class. And that is a semester long course, really helping to develop the resilience necessary, mm. both to be successful as an as an artist, a student artist, but also as a student in the world, uh, an artist in the world. Mm-hmm. And that's a really important class. Um, mental, physical wellness for us is a really high priority. And that's how we get it started is, is, is making sure that that's in there. And then, of course, you know, as part of the curriculum, you're take, taking things like stagecraft, you're taking things like voice and movement for the actor, and and um, you're taking things like a survey of dramatic literature, right? So there are a number of other things that help round out uh, that course makeup, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but you're right. Uh, we are a liberal arts education. We are not a conservatory, which means that um, about one third of your, of your uh, credits ends mm-hmm. up being liberal arts. Um, a lot of our students uh, come in with college credits or a lot of our students take a number of those liberal arts either over the summer, winter, or um, 
uh, summer or winter sessions as a way mm-hmm. to allow themselves to take extra uh, electives because that ends up being where everyone's uh, passion is. Mm-hmm. Um, we we work hard to make sure that our students who are taking those gen eds find gen eds where they have passion and interest. Mm-hmm. And there's an enormous range of classes that are available that you could be using to work towards that. And so we have a, a short list that we often go, hey, here are some classes that people in the past have really uh-huh. found to be really valuable for them. Um, and then we also just sort of follow up, follow the leads of our, our students because here's the other thing that is uh, sort of unique about our BFA. Um, you, don't, you won't hear this at every BFA is that we intentionally have designed our BFA to have flexibility and allows our students, in fact, we encourage our students to minor in mm-hmm. other things. Um, and so our many of our students minor, I would say two thirds of our BFAs have a minor in something. Now, a big number of those are in dance or minoring uh-huh. in music, right? Uh-huh. But we have students who minor in music education or uh-huh. music or, or psychology or English or science, or we have students uh, or foreign language, right? And that ends up being a big part of their gen eds because a number of those classes can and double. Yep. And so we've put together a way to let them do all of those things. We've worked hard to make our, our curriculum as flexible as possible because going back to what I was saying, we want unique, authentic artists. We don't want, oh, that's a slippery rock artist. We uh-huh. want them to come out and be their the best version of themselves. The only way we can do that is give them toolkits to be unique and to give them the ability to create a curriculum that's tailored for them. Well said, and and I was just going to ask you how what percentage minor, so you're ready with that question. But what and do any any of them double major, or what percent would say I'm actually going to get a whole another major? Well, with the BFA, it's 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 largely impossible. Um, I'll tell you, we have one. You know, it's a new program, so I'm sure that we will have more people later. We have one person who's currently attempting to do it. Uh-huh. It's She's finding it incredibly difficult. It is most likely going to add extra years. She came in with an enormous amount of uh, credits, uh, mm-hmm. college credits, and she's taking full load summer and winter. Like Oof. it's really not something that we are encouraging in any capacity. Yeah. Um, we're not going to tell you no because it's your education, um, but it's really, really hard because essentially um, a, a BFA right is a double major. That's mm-hmm. what it is, right? Yeah. Um, and so we really encourage the minor. I really dis- disencourage, uh, dissuade the 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 double major, um, but. Uh, but I will say that that is specifically what our BA in acting uh-huh. is for. We have, set, we have that degree and we have an, a number of students that take it. And the reason that they take that class is because they're passionate about getting the, the, many of the same classes at the BFA. They're in a lot of those still those uh, upper level classes and they can double major in something else. And that's really where we have our Totally. Our double majors. Though the BAs may or, may or may not, you can tell me have access to the showcase, which I want to talk about. How do we prepare for the launch into the business for the BFA MTs, the BFA actors, and then if anything in the, with the BAs? Great, great question. So the BAs do not participate in the in the showcase. That is that is true. Um, it is specifically for our BFA students. Um, and here's the thing. So uh, going back to sort of where we started um, with our conversation about uh, my job as a as a showcase consultant, mm-hmm. um, I found that uh, job a little heartbreaking at times, um, and it was challenging for me because um, I saw so many students putting all of their hopes and dreams into 90 seconds or into mm-hmm. three minutes. Um, and, and, and that idea of sort of walking into a, a theater with a whole group of strangers staring at you and hoping that someone likes you after sharing the tiniest part of yourself mm-hmm. on one day. And I just really felt that that was creating some damage, was really, really causing a lot of anxiety and stress for our students. And so uh, I really decided to, to, to reinvent parts of the Senior Showcase as a way to try to respond to that. Um, so our Senior Showcase is a little unique in parts, and some parts is, is somewhat traditional. The first thing that we do is that uh, we work really hard that in starting in your very fr- first semester freshman year, we start training you on how to apply for summer stock uh, opportunities. Uh, we have a class in your very first semester that's that's covering how to audition, find good material, how to do your self-tapes, all of that, so that they can start really getting involved in the professional world as early as possible. And in your freshman, sophomore, and junior year, we're bringing in guest artists 
almost every other week to make sure that they are engaging with our students. And many of the people that we're bringing in as guest artists are the same people who are going to be part of our senior showcase. Mm -hmm. So you have ability to start building relationship early in the process. Then the second part of our senior showcase is uh, the the part that many people have now transitioned to, which is that we do a a robust virtual showcase where we make sure we record a a, a lot of the material for our students so that they have it and they can put it right on Actors Access on their websites and use it to help promote themselves Mm -hmm. for the next four or five years, honestly. And we help to produce that, and that is all completely paid for by the university. Um, Then we do, I think the, the thing that I think is the most unique part which is that we do a um, New York City immersion experience. And I call it that because it's not a, a, a traditional showcase. What we do is I use the same Rolodex that I had used to pack uh, the houses when I was a showcase consultant. So it's a lot of the same people. But now what we're doing is we're having them come in and do two, three, four hour workshops with mm-hmm. our students so that they really one on one get to work with our students. Our students are learning through the experience and developing relationship again. Mm-hmm. Right. And so uh, it was remarkable because we did our very first showcase this year. I wasn't sure how his work. I was kind of anxious about it. But to a person, every single one of the guests that we brought in said, this is incredible. Please let me come back next year. And it started working. So yeah. one of our students auditioned uh, for a casting director on Monday of our showcase uh, of our immersion and on Tuesday had a final callback for uh, a national tour. Mm-hmm. Right. And so th- th- it's, it's happening in real time. And I feel really proud about that because it's, it creates relationship and allows them to really, uh, have a full experience of sharing of themselves and not sort of this 90 second clip of curated overly over rehearsed material. Right. Um, and then the last part, our fourth part is that for the entirety of the spring semester, every week, sometimes two, three, four times a week, um, we have, uh, zoom auditions happening Mm -hmm. for our seniors with, professionals in all of the other cities, Mm -hmm. right? Because we know that New York is not the answer for everyone. And so we have artistic directors zooming in from North Carolina and Chicago and Seattle Mm -hmm. and Florida and directors and agents and casting directors all zooming in, meeting our students and doing the same thing, doing a workshop with them, getting to know them as artists, getting to explore their material. And then again, it's already led to people getting jobs. So I feel ecstatic about it. It's really smart. And it's so funny. Just this morning, I was recording a a takeaway from my previous uh, episode is for the episode that's going to launch on Wednesday, talking about that creativity and showcases and, and how important that is for people, you know, in 2023 who are coming in with a little bit more ear to the ground, you know, understanding of what the industry is that, it, you know, I would be suspicious if I'm a student and I'm like, oh, your answer is just New York and L.A. showcase in person. And that's it. Like, I'm like, that works well enough, but it was already maybe a little bit failing when I graduated from school. That was already a little old. And yeah. now it's like, you got to ca- catch up to the world. That's, you know, those 90 seconds are not it's not the answer, the be all end all. I don't think know. so either. And a person feel, is I, not a, a seat I, filler is not necessarily about, oh, good, there's someone in that seat. That means I'm going to get a call back. That means they're a person, you know. Getting yeah. a high level connection is going to be much more important. That's right. And, and, and also, I think it's important to have a multi prong attack. Yep. Some of our students are going to thrive one on one. Some of our students are going to thrive over Zoom. Some of our students, you know, right? Also, because you have to talk about neurodiversity, you have to talk about mm-hmm. all of these things of access, and and you have to find ways that each of your students can thrive in each of the environments that that they will thrive in. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's why we have this really clear multi prong opportunity, so that you know, depending on who they are and where their strengths are, they have an opportunity for success that's not built around this 90 seconds. It's, really it's just, I- I'm excited about it. Yep. Um, let's talk about another exciting thing for Slippery Rock, which is your cost, which <laughs> if I'm seeing this correctly, this is, looks like very low cost compared to some other places. Yeah. I see in-state tuition around $10,000, a little over 10000 out of state not only at 14,000 or 146, right? Yeah, so it's 146 if you have a 30 or better. It's uh-huh. 19 if you do not have a 30 or better. But all right? of our students have a 30 or better. I know, I, mean, I know, I know, right. Not, I, I, some rarely, listeners don't, of course. I know. No, I rarely have an issue. I rarely have an issue with that. Um, uh-huh. uh, but yeah, no, that's something that I that that's also one of the reasons why I felt called to be at Slippery Rock. I was I was being recruited by some other high-level uh, universities, and when I was looking to be at a at, as a head of a music theater program and uh i you know i saw so many of my peers 
struggle with student debt and see Mm -hmm. them leave the industry because they could not afford to audition Mm -hmm. at the same time as pay their bills. And so it felt really important to me to find a university that that had a low base cost that was that felt realistic and reasonable. I think spending $14,000 a year for education, that sounds right to me, right? right? That's That feels right. You know, when it's $120,000, that feels yeah. insane to me, right? Well, at some point, it feels like bloat. It just feels like I'm like, I, right. I know how much these things cost. I'm like, I could put together classes for X amount of dollars. That is way right. less than some of these tuitions. You go, how is that? How could that be the way much it costs? It just, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But, but then how does it work with stuff like scholarships? Are there additional scholar, academic scholarships? Are there additional merit scholarships? Or more, most people are paying, obviously, some lower total price. Are more people paying close to that sticker price? It's a great question. And uh, the reality is that because we are a brand new program, we have essentially no talent scholarships available mm-hmm. at this point. Obviously, that's a priority for me over the next couple of years. You asked what, where we're gro- going. Well, that's one of the yep. places we're going is we're going to develop ways to, to get scholarship money for our students. Um, there are academic scholarships. There are service-based scholarships. Mm-hmm. Um, there are need-based scholarships. Those things do exist through the, through the university. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are, unfortunately, are, are essentially no talent scholarships. Um, but uh, the reality is that you know, I, I tell this story often, uh, and we're not the only school that this applies to, right? But um, two years ago, there was a young woman who called me and said, I have $120,000 worth of scholarships uh-huh. at this university. What can you do for me? Right uh-huh. over four years. And I said, I can't give you a single dollar, but let's run the numbers. And yeah. at the end of it, I was still cheaper. Uh, that's what I was going to say. Like, we have so many, you know, if this, yep. let's say some, a more mid-level school is $40,000 a year or whatever, and they give you $20,000, i am like, you're still coming out ahead from $20,000, uh, you know, versus even if you're out of state here. I mean, it's a, really, it's a really reasonable cost. All right, I'm going to stop glowing about your costs, though congratulations. <laughs> great. Um, talk to me a little bit about, I know in these, especially the last two years of you um, running the program, where, as I know you recruit nationally, how many of your students come from that Pennsylvania area and are paying even less in the outstate, in the in-state tuition um, versus how many come from the surrounding tri-state area? How many come from across the country, around the world? What does the sort of breakdown of your students that come in? And then I'd love to hear you mention some of the places they end up, but where the sort of diaspora of them ending up is. Well, it's changed really, really drastically in the four years that we've had recruitment class, uh, re- uh, that we've had a, a BFA. Mm-hmm. Uh, in our first year, it was 100% from Pennsylvania. In our second year, it was about 75% from uh, Pennsylvania. In our third year, it was about 25% from Pennsylvania. Hmm. And this most recent class was about 10% from Pennsylvania. Oh, it'll be negative 4% next year, is what you're saying. <laughs> it's going to go negative. Yeah, it's really, really shifted fast. Uh-huh. Um, and we really are bringing in students from all over the country. Um, we have a number of students. Uh, we have a lot of students from Florida, a lot of students from Texas, a uh, good number from California. Um, but then also from our region, Ohio is a big, is a big, uh, uh, draw for us. Um, uh, Pennsylvania, obviously. Uh, and then, you know, New Jersey and Michigan and, you know, we have students from kind of all over the place. It's, it's been wild to see how, how quickly that shifted. I have to Um, say you're the first person who's given me that many concise numbers and I appreciate it. I I don't expect actual numbers. Everyone's like, I don't have numbers. I'm like, I know you don't have numbers, but that was good. You had numbers. Well, you know, I'll tell you why, because as somebody who is trying to make things better, the only way you can do that is by evaluating. Right. Uh And so every year we literally sit down and do an evaluation of our last year. And we go, what was successful? Where were we successful? Where did we create relationships with students? Should we spend our time going to that event again? Do we have the resources to do, you know what I mean? And the only way you can do that is if you run the numbers and you actually know what, where you're getting your students from and and where it's paying off, you know? Um, So, so I'm, 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 I'm all, I'm really passionate about, about doing that. Um, So to answer your question about where do our students head? Well, we just graduated our first class, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, uh, that group of students, um, I was proud to say that um, uh, three of our three, uh, ha- so ha- we had six uh, seniors, uh, mm-hmm. as happens with a first class, it usually is very small. Um, we had six seniors, three of which walked out the door um, with jobs lined up, um, which I was really, really mm-hmm. proud of. Um, we had a number of the students also having uh, jobs starting in the fall, which another mm-hmm. three were, were um, uh, of those, some, some overlap, were set up for jobs with the fall. And we also had a number of students uh, with another other, a number of other really exciting opportunities that, ha- that they had been uh, uh, given. One student is going to teach theater at a, at a school, which she's really excited about. Mm-hmm. And, and another student is actually staying in the area and doing some um, directing work. 
Um, so it, it's, it's really, really exciting. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that a majority of that six have a plan to head to New York City. Uh -huh. um, but many of those are after they finish the jobs that they have lined up, right? Totally so who sense. knows yeah. what happens between now and May? Because we have one one young woman who has who has worked literally straight through from now till May, uh -huh. and so I, you know, who knows by that point where where she will want to head? Right, she and, end up a Pittsburgh actor and exactly, a Seattle, and, who and, knows, yeah. and I'm thrilled about that because you know. While while New York was my center and where I spent twenty years and where I have my primary relationships and why I'm able to do a, a New York immersion experience is because I'm able to bring in those Tony nominated people and these amazing uh, artists to to work with our students. But that's not the answer for everybody. Mm -hmm. People can make really robust, exciting careers uh, that f are artistically fulfilling and also uh, fulfilling for them and their communities all over the country, right? Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of students being able to do lots of things there. I love it. Um, my last question on this section, then we'll take a little break and talk about the admission a little bit more. Sure. Um, but my last question is just about, so um, you mentioned the the yield. So we're you know shooting for around the 14 number or whatever, that one year you, you tried for 12 and got 10. This year, it seemed like you got more than you were expecting, right? <laughs> yeah. As you're having those conversations, you know, and, and seeing, you know, I want these people to sign on the dotted line. What do you feel like makes them say, yes, to Slippery Rock, this was the deciding factor. And then what do you think when students end up going, actually, I'm going to go somewhere else of my my options, some of which are giving me $120,000. What can you do yeah. for me? Right? How much are, are people, you know, why do they make that decision? Why do they tell you, you know, Slippery Rock wasn't for me? Yeah. Um, so here's the thing that I would say is, is our, our thing, our, our thing is, is not only is it this idea of sort of unique, authentic artists, that's, that's a really important part of the process. But I would say that the other thing that we lean very, very heavily in both in terms of in terms of finding the right students, but also in terms of the college experience at Slippery Rock, because we are a new program, and because also so much of my success as an artist, as well as many of the other faculty success as an artist, stemmed from our entrepreneurial spirit. We are really interested specifically in students who are interested in rolling up their sleeves engaging in their in their entrepreneurial spirit and and committing to make slippery rock a better place than when they arrived hmm. that's sort of our thing and if a student comes in and go and, and sees what we're doing i mean the the reality is that we we've run you know you asked about numbers we've we've run our numbers and the reality is that um in the last four years uh, 95, that's even more than that. It's like 97% of the students who have come to our BFA have set foot on our campus. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is when they are there, they meet the faculty, they see the kind of work that we're doing and they fall in love with us because they see that entrepreneurial spirit, that sense of roll up your sleeves, figure it out. I don't have it yet. How do we get that? How do we do it? And we work as a a, a team, genuinely, the students, mm -hmm. the faculty, everybody's working together to make the program better. And they fall in love with that. They go, I want to be part of that. Um, and that's the thing that I think tips people into wanting to come here is because they go, I love, I love the energy of the students. I love the way that the faculty engages with our students. I love that the way that the students have a voice and are, are part of it. And, and not in that way of like, I demand this. Mm -hmm. We don't have that at Slippery Rock. What we have is students going, I want this. How can I help make it happen? Mm -hmm. That's what we have. And that is a thrilling environment to be a part of, right? If, if stu the students that, that don't end up at our university, I find tend to fit one of two categories. Either they... Um, they find something about another school that they are really passionate about. Maybe it's a specific college professor. Maybe it's uh, the way that they, um, that school, the, the, the resources that that school has. Maybe, you know, a lot of students want uh, semesters abroad. We don't have mm -hmm. semesters abroad. We have a trip abroad, and I can talk about that. But we don't have semesters abroad. So then it's, we're not a match, right? Um, or they want four semesters of film and television. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one semester. That's not our focus, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's pieces there that, that that other students kind of fall in love with. I think that that's that's one category. Or they come in having an expectation of I want it all sort of handed to me a certain uh -huh. way that is that is proven out. Uh -huh. I've seen that 
you know, every graduate from slipper, from this university goes off to do these things and they have this way that they do it and they do it. They've done it the same way for 10 years and it works brilliantly. Those are not our students, uh-huh. right? Because we don't have a pr- proven track record. We're brand new. And yep. because that's not who I think we e- ever will be. I, as long as I'm involved in Slippery Rock, which I have no intention of not being involved in Slippery Rock, I can't imagine an energy and a spirit where we're not constantly evaluating going, how can we do this better? Let's, uh-huh. let's, let's, let's evolve. Let's grow. Let's, let's, what, what don't we have? How do we get it? How do we engage our students in helping us get it? Right? Like that, that's who we are. Mm-hmm. Totally makes sense. All right. We're going to take a short break. And on the back end, we're going to talk with Aaron about the admission process of Slippery Rock. All right, we are back with Aaron Galligan Sterl, and we're going to talk about the admission process. And in short, I want to start with the auditions and just ask, you know, what do you think makes a great audition for you? Wow, what a great question. Um, well, we're really looking for students that are um, that know who they are, uh, that have a point of view about the world, uh, and that have a generosity of spirit. And so we we work hard to really get to know our student, know our auditionees. Um, we, you know, we're not a school where you're going to come in, sing two songs and walk out. Mm-hmm. You know, at, we're going to, we're going to have conversation with you. We're going to give you adjustments. We're going to explore with you, really try to get to know who you are. Um, we look at, you know, in the, we do pre-screens, we, the wild cards are like maybe the most important thing for us, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like we're really just looking to see who is this person? Do they have a point of view about the world? Are they passionate about learning? Um, do we think that they will fit in with our energy and spirit of the students mm-hmm. and the, the type of people that we have at Slippery Rock? Um, and, you know, do they have sort of this core, unique authenticity to them? And, and mm-hmm. if so, then we just, we, we jump at it. And that, that's, you know, we have absolute clear. When we see somebody walk in, we usually turn to each other and go, that's a Slippery Rock student. Uh-huh. We know uh, it I- immediately. I love it. And I think, you know, it's advice that they certainly heard before, and but certainly from us too. I mean, MTCA, we always talk about being your authentic self. And, you know, yeah. I, I think that used to be sort of sim- a little bit more unique advice in the world where people were talking about type and all those things. But I think more schools really do come in with the idea of, we want to see who you are. We want to yeah. walk in the room and do that. So I'm, I'm sort of on a mission to zero in on professors when they say, we want you to walk in the room as you. Yeah. What does it, what does that look like to you? What are you seeing when you see a student walk in the room that makes you go, that's someone who's in their own body, who is them, who I feel like I'm meeting that student. What does that look like actualizing in an audition room? It's a great question. And and I'm really appreciative that you asked it because actually this is, so when I go to many of the conferences and um, I'm working with students who are auditioning, I do a workshop specifically on this because mm-hmm. because everybody does say, I, I want you to be yourself. Well, <laughs> You know, if I if I was a college student, I would say, aren't I myself at all times, whether I'm doing what you want me to or not, right? Right. And so, you know, we do need to get to the bottom of it. We need to kind of approach it from a pedagogical point of view. So I would say there's a couple of things. The first thing that I would say is that the material that you choose should feel like something that you feel passionate about talking and sharing about and feels authentic to you. I don't want you to play a character and, you know, do the perfect, you know, Scottish accent when you're singing mm-hmm. Shrek. I want it, I want, because I'm not interested in casting track. I'm interested in learning who you are. So if you're going to sing who I'd be, I want to know what are, what does that mean to you specifically? Mm-hmm. And, and having clarity about why you chose that piece, what it says about who you are as a human, and then engaging in that story in, in that way. I think also making sure that you are truly present. Um, I feel like a lot of students uh, have prepared to the point that they've lost themselves. Mm -hmm. They lose a spontaneity, they lose an ability to engage and they fall into um, into, uh, something that is is overly prepared and rehearsed and and lacks um, connection. Mm -hmm. And so really zeroing in on who your scene partner is, really what it is that you want to achieve, um, whether it's a song or a monologue, and really going after that and letting it be fresh and new this time in a way that maybe you've never explored previously. Give yourself, you know, the tiniest adjustment for yourself right before you walk in, right? Uh-huh. What if I change my scene partner a little bit? What if I change that, you know, this morning I had an argument with them? What if I change the way I'm holding my body? What if I change that, you know, and give yourself something to allow for the spontaneity uh, of of invention to yeah. allow yourself to really connect in. So. You know, those are some of the things that I, I see students do that, that helps us lean forward. 
right? And go, oh yeah, that's, that's what it is. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for them. And I think that those are a couple of the things that help really engage those students. Three fantastic answers. I love that little pre-adjustment thing. It's something I've definitely told students before of like, they'll come back after our mock auditions and go, why was it always so good after I got time. the adjustment, right? Yeah. And I was like, you know, you can give yourself a direction. You don't have to do it the quote unquote good yep. way the first time. You can do, you know, you can have fun with it, right? It doesn't have to be something wacky at the first, but you can give yourself a little challenge, a little something yep. to, to do. I, I would but, also say we put we put an enormous um, weight on the interview and the adjustment. Uh-huh. You know, the reality is that yes, is there is there a um, uh, an initial amount of skill and and potential that we're looking for? Yes, and 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 you know, as somebody coming in who who has some training or shows an immense amount of potential, mm-hmm. um, you know, gets you to the callback. And we always say if you get a callback with us. That means that you are talented enough. Put that off the side. That's not mm-hmm. what we're talking about from here until the end. Mm-hmm. We no longer care. The talent part is like, can you sing? Can you can you act? Can you engage with who you are? Can we tell a story? Do we have language facility? Do we have a physical facility? You know, those are the things that we kind of look at. And then we go, now it's about getting to know you. And we mm-hmm. really do engage in conversation and, and adjustments and then and then a, a, a fairly fairly comprehensive interview mm-hmm. with each of our students to really try to get to know them and see if not if they're good enough but to see if they're the right students to thrive here yeah because the reality is everybody's talented enough and there's a thousand incredible schools and so I don't want the best students I want the best students for slippery rock uh-huh yeah, it's well said. Well, what would one of those interviews look like? So, you know, I think some of the, some, actually some of our students have no idea yet if they're listening to this and they're early. But, you know, if I have a vague idea about what a college interview is like, how might it differ? How might a, you know, in the room audition be different than sort of a standard college interview? Yeah. So the type of questions that we end up sort of having having conversations about is, you know, we, we want to know what what the person's deal breakers are. So when they think about I don't know which school I want to go to yet, Mm -hmm. but I know for a fact I need this or I absolutely do not want that. Mm -hmm. That's one of our key questions because it really does reveal a lot about who they are as humans and what their needs are. Whether that's, I really want a senior showcase that does Mm -hmm. this. Well, that tells us information. Or I really want small classrooms. That's where I thrive the best. Great, that helps us know. Or I really need a, a school that uh, does really inventive, exciting production. You know, I don't know. Whatever mm-hmm. the things are, I need. I, I I need it to be near home. Okay, well then, why are you flying to us from California? Right. Those are the type of things that really help zero in on who they are and what their needs are as students. That's an important thing. We always have some question that's related to conflict, and we do different things about how do students. And negotiate conflict when they when they when they're when they hit a wall when they when they run up to something how do they figure out how to move through that mm-hmm. and and the students answers are really really valuable and revealing to help us understand if they're going to have that sense of um entrepreneurial spirit the sense of um generosity that we feel like is a really important part of the community that we've built um for our students um and so those are the type of questions we have. A, we have a list of like four or five different questions, yep. but those are the kind of things that we try to engage with. Is you know sometimes we ask sort of the traditional, like, you know, what what are your dream roles? Because uh-huh. sometimes that can be valuable in terms of getting to know how they see themselves. Um, but but usually we try to find things or, that maybe aren't asked by other schools to try to find out who they are. Totally makes sense. And how much in the room? I know as we get later in the decision making, there may be some question of yield. And do you think this person can say yes to you? But how much in the room are you worried about, hey, how this person is showing me interest versus how much are you deciding based on their answers? We think they're a good fit for us. right? Are you ever deciding, hey, it seems like they're not that interested in us. And so we're going to move on from that soon. I guess because yeah, I think some of the students feel trapped by that of like, yeah, I want to show interest, but I don't want to lie to you. But, I, yeah. you know, you're not number one on my list right now. And, you know, that, those kind of conversations. Yeah, um, both. Uh, but I would also say more important than than enthusiasm to me is transparency. Because that's actually how I work. Um, mm-hmm. Any of the students who have been in the process with me know that I'm on the f- I'm emailing them if they are on our wait list, if they are getting an offer, if they are strongly being considered. I am emailing them or on the phone with them once a week, right? Mm-hmm. Going here's where we are. 
we've had this many accepts. We're looking for this. I'm going to, you know, I need to, I need two more people and then I can reach out to you. You're at mm -hmm. the top of my list. You're in the middle of my list. You might really want to consider looking at other universities, right? I'm transparent because mm -hmm. I know how incredibly complicated and difficult the end game is. It's brutal, right? It's mm -hmm. just really, really difficult. And the only way that I can help move it forward is through transparency and hoping that it becomes reciprocal, both from other universities, but uh -huh. also in terms of the students. And when a student is able to say to me, Aaron, you're number three, I go, great, no problem. You're still number one for me. I'll wait. Or, <laughs> yeah. or you know, great. I, I appreciate that. I'm going to release a couple people off my wait list that maybe I wasn't planning on because uh -huh. I still might get you. Right? right. And and that and I and I will hold the place for you, but now I know that the odds of it are, are a little bit less, right? Mm -hmm. Or somebody saying, Aaron, you are my number one. No matter what happens, I'm coming to your school. I will say that does speak volumes about whether I think that they're probably a slippery rock kid because totally. you know, I'm looking for that entrepreneurial spirit. I'm looking right. for somebody who goes, I want this and I'm gonna work out figure out how to get it. Right. Yeah. That feels like our thing. To totally makes sense. Um, and then what on the academic end? So let's say you're interested in someone uh, artistically, you mentioned the 3.0 to um, get the cheaper cost, but is there anything else in terms of academics, that, uh, a bar that students have to pass to get into the, the school itself? And then how does that coordination work with you guys with um, the theater department and then the academic part of the school? Yeah. So we ask our students to pre-screen first. You can uh, apply to the university at the same time if you want to, but you do not have to. Mm -hmm. um, we we get a lot of you guys do it the right way, by the way. That's how all schools should do it. Few <laughs> schools do that, but that's the right way because then you. you don't have to waste an application fee if you're not past the. Uh, absolutely, yeah. and you know, and we found that you know as our numbers tick up, you know, two years ago we had 150 people apply. This year we had 700 people apply, right? Um, and so as next our next year it's going to be 3,000. Is what you're saying? Oh my lord! It's just uh, this <laughs> 600 increase or whatever. Yeah. Um, as you know, as our numbers increase, you know, I don't want you to waste your money. So, so do the pre-screen first. Once, if you are, if you get a call back again, then now is sort of a time to start considering maybe doing an application. You don't even have to yet, right? Mm -hmm. um, then you have your call back. After your call back, we basically sort everyone into in consideration or out of consideration. Mm -hmm. If you are out of consideration, great, move on with your life. You never had to pay, uh, you know, for our our, our uh, application fees. Mm -hmm. uh, um, if you are in consideration, that's when we say, okay, now go apply, right? Mm -hmm. And our application process for the university is separate from our audition process. They are two separate entities. You must be accepted by both, and. Uh, and we have a conversation with with um, with those with that department, right? So once we have our list of students that we're making offers to, we reach out to uh, admissions and go, "Here's who we're making offers to," and they go, "This person didn't make it through," and we go, "Okay, great. Is there anything we can do?" And we start having uh -huh. conversations about it, uh -huh. right? Um, and uh, so far, we've had we've been able to figure out how to make uh, all but one work. Great. So, yeah. so feel pretty proud of that. Pretty, pretty good. Yeah, it's great. And then what about, do you look at any part of the academic application? Do you look at letters of rec? Do you look at essays? Or is that all stuff that's dealt with with the um, academic department? Totally the admissions office. Um, okay. So uh, I would be lying if I didn't say that some students just send me stuff directly. And if uh -huh. they do, sometimes I look at it. Usually, yep. I, I, let me say it a different way. If they do, I look at it, yep. right? Um, I feel it's important to... Uh, have all the information that I possibly can get. So I'm somebody who watches the full audition tape. I, I'm not someone, even the 700, right? I'm not going to watch the first 10 seconds and go no uh -huh. and move on. I feel like it's part of my responsibility to see the entire tape. Um, I look at all the materials. I look at your resume, your headshot, your wild card, your videos, your dance. If you send me a dance clip, I'm going to watch it, right? I'm going to look at all of it and, and then be able to make a, a good decision from there. Um, but at the same time, when we're talking about equity and we're talking about access, I don't feel like uh, everyone has access or the ability or the, to, to write that exceptional um, right. 
interview or uh, I'm sorry, uh, essay mm -hmm. or how, you know, and so I don't want to, I don't want to, to, um, rule people out because of it. everyone now has chat GPT. You can write a great essay on there. Right? It's easy to AI, uh... generated essay. not recommending, um, but <laughs> we have to talk about it because you mentioned the wild card being the most important. We certainly have people talk about it being important. I'd love to hear kind of what you're looking for. And by the way, I love that you watched the whole well, pre-screen, not everybody does watch the entire pre-screen and all the parts. But but if you're, as you're throughout this pre-screen, you're looking and you're really valuing that wild card. What are you valuing in it? What do you like to see? Is there anything that you see that you go, oh, this maybe is not a Slippery Rock student if I see this kind of thing? Um, you know, I'm always looking for somebody who um, is creative, is unique, is authentic, um, shares something about themselves that uh, is uh, true and something that they're passionate about that helps me understand who they are beyond um, their the traditional musical theater skills, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that if someone does a does a wild card that and they put a tap song tap dance on there or they do a an additional pop song that I discount it and immediately say no, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. But I will say I, I weigh those things less than when somebody does something else, something mm -hmm. shares that they uh, you know. Uh, do they do a short film about how they volunteer at the AS ASPCA for cats, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, or, or that they do a video about that they uh, are, are passionate about fencing and they show them doing a fencing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, those things I find really valuable because it helps me to get to know them as a whole person. Um, certainly sometimes people sing original songs or mm -hmm. do original, original work. That's always really interesting to me. Um, so I, I would say that it, it should in some way show another part of who you are, uh, another aspect of, of you that maybe I don't know yet, mm -hmm. right? That from just looking at your resume that, that will uh, help us understand more about you. I love it. And, you know, you mentioned talking about, um, you know, access and equity being really important to you. You know, as you think about filling out your class, and especially as a, a newer program, this is maybe extra challenging. You mentioned yep. sort of the increase of geographic diversity. Yep. How do you kind of consciously consider the gender balance? And if you think about height balance and size balance and specifics of racial diversity and yep. those geographical questions, how do you consider that, especially you know, as we talk about stuff like waitlist movement, you know, if you have an initial offer, you know, how do you continue to, to calculate or, or, or decide those things as you're considering putting together what ends up being 21, but what you're trying to get around 14 yeah. um, students? Well, the first thing that we do is we're really committed to, to finding the best possible group of artists that we possibly can, right? And that we try to let that be regardless of those identity pieces. Um, uh, and, and we also try to allow for um, an open point of view around um, making sure that we have a lot of different types of humans, right? And so both are true at the same time, which is such a weird answer, right? Mm -hmm. But we are going, we, we don't want everyone to be the same, but we want to make sure that we are committed to the, to the best group of humans and slippery rock artists as possible. So, you know, to, to, Answer more specifically, um, we, uh, you know, if a student comes in who maybe has, it, it comes from a disadvantaged background in some capacity, we look for the potential there. We don't, you know, in the same way that like we try to create equity with the dance audition, we do, mm -hmm. we do it the same in every part of it. And we go, you know, that person shows an unbelievable amount of potential, but obviously uh, has had some struggles in their lives that whether they've shared that with us or, or we've been able to deduce, deduce it or otherwise, you know, we try to help let that be part of the decision-making process. Um, and, you know, we, we also, when, when you talk about wait lists, I'll, you know, I'll say, the wait list really is where, um, you know, it can be very valuable to stay in contact with me. You know, mm -hmm. if there's one thing that I, the one piece of advice I will give to every single student who's interested in Slippery Rock, return your emails. That's mm -hmm. it. That's right. That's it. Because if you return your emails, even if it's to say not interested mm -hmm. or I already have that information or you're number five on my list, whatever, mm -hmm. that speaks to me that you are responsible and interested and going to do the work because so much of our work as artists is being responsive and mm -hmm. engaging with the world around us. And so that's a huge part of the, 
the wait list process yep. is honestly, I'm not looking at who's the most enthusiastic. I'm looking at who's res responsible and, and responding to us and engaging in, in that capacity. And so, you know, yes, do we, do we look at a list and go, you know, we don't have any of those type of humans. We uh -huh. need to find some of those. Let's, let's get, try to find that person. Sure. And we also go, yeah, but that person is passionate and exciting uh -huh. and is a slippery rock student. So they, you know what I mean? And so yeah. it's a conversation with our whole faculty that we're constantly having is how do we balance diversity in every part of the word, whether that's a yep. trans student, whether that's sexuality, whether that's race, whether that's gender identity, right? Um, you mentioned uh, socio neurodiversity. Yeah. Neurodiversity, socioeconomic mm -hmm. diversity, right? Yeah. We re uh, um, Geographic diversity, we really are, we do want to engage in all of those yeah. things. Um, and we really actively pursue that. And we also are going, great. And that person feels like somebody who would be a blast to have around for four years. Yeah. And we need them to be part of our team. Yeah. Because they're going to totally make everything better. Totally makes sense. Um, are you guys keeping virtual auditions as we move forward? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. It's a, it, you, you can't not do that. Yeah. In this world of, of both access and, and, and equity, I mean, it's for just sure. not possible. So... You know, we we attend as many um, of the events as we can. We use all of our events as our pre-screens. So if uh -huh. you're going to be at one of those events, you do not need to do accepted pre-screen. We will we will it counts exactly the same. Uh -huh. You also could do accepted. Happy to have you through accepted. Eve, any of those we 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 are absolutely equal. I will say that. We are considering, we have not made a decision about this yet. There is a chance that we may use Chicago Unifieds this year as both pre-screen and or callback. We haven't uh -huh. decided about that yet for sure. But all as of right now, if they did Chicago Unifieds, it would be the same as Pittsburgh Unifieds exactly. where they didn't have to do a virtual callback. With you. Exactly. It'd be exactly the same. Uh -huh. And then we move into the callback portion. Yep. We, we, you have the option of either a virtual callback or an in-person Knowing our history of 97% of our students committing to our school if they set foot on our campus, we want you to come to campus. Yeah. We do. We want you to. And so we have more in-person days than virtual mm -hmm. uh, because we want to encourage you to come because we know, we know that if you come to Slippery Rock, you will either fall in love with it or know that it's not right for you. Mm -hmm. And either one of those is the right thing. And we need our students to know that because the worst thing in the world would be a student coming to Slippery Rock and then being at the wrong school and being miserable for four years, right? It's so true. That's the number of our students and parents, really, who think about this process sometimes in terms of like, we just got to get them into the right school. I'm like, I'm like you don't want to trick yourself into school. No. You don't want to to fool someone into accepting you and then actually have it be a terrible relationship for four years. Absolutely. Like, you want to find the place that's actually right for you. Absolutely. And, and I'll also say that's why we do it as our final callback. And we are very selective with our final callback. Mm -hmm. We only call you back if we are very serious about you. Mm -hmm. So it is not the type of thing where you're throwing away money going to a final callback. This is an opportunity for all of us to get to know each other. And we, of course, do a virtual final callback. Right. And we try to, we do everything we can to replicate the in-person experience virtual, but it is not the same. It isn't. And so the other thing that we strongly encourage is that if you do that virtual callback, we then work really hard to try to get you to come to campus once to you're visit. accepted. Have yeah, to visit. And how many of the how many of the in-person callback people then use that as their visit? Do a lot of them do Almost the in-person callback and then come back and visit again? No, Almost you're saying they've, they've, we, they've seen the shows, they've taken classes, they've we, gotten the feel of what the school would be like. So they yeah, know. We have a, we have a yeah. very robust uh, audition day. Our final callback day runs from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. You basically mm. arrive, you do Q&A, you go... All the students go and meet with students by themselves. The par parents meet with the faculty. We do workshops all morning. We then do... Um, we then do all of our auditions. Then we have an open rehearsal where you get to come and watch the rehearsal of one of our shows with mm -hmm. our faculty member. Then you go to a main stage show and see the final product of another show. Like we work really hard to give you a full immersive experience so that by the time you leave there, you know for a fact whether Slippery Rock is your school or not. That's, that's a two in one. You're getting a, a visit and yeah. an audition truly in one. Yeah. And, th and, and that's why, because we don't want you to have to spend the money to come back. That doesn't right. make any sense. We do have students that do that, but, but it's a, it's a very small minority that do that. Um, and the, the students that come to visit are the students who come to our virtual day because we, we do everything we can, but it's not anything like the, the in-person experience. Totally.
Totally makes sense. All right, my last question for you is just to the parents out there, um, you know, also concerned with their kids riding bikes wherever they ride them, um, <laughs> as they, you know, as they look at this process, and especially now more of our listeners are going to transition into the junior, so this is really next year's class, yeah. as people are going to be listening to this now, and they're starting to approach the process. What advice do you have for them for Slippery Rock, but also just in this process in general to the parents of young teens excited about this uh, art form? Yeah, well, the first thing is that... Um, Encourage your students to re return their emails. That's number one. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> getting because, underlined in the show notes. Yeah, you, you can't do it yourself. You can't do it yourself. You, you need mm -hmm. the student needs to do it, and they need to start finding that that um, individuality. And and uh, we get that. We get that. But know that that's 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 really important. It's really really mm -hmm. important. Um, so I would say um, beyond that, um, you know, ask fellow parents ask, look, look online, you know, we, we, we sometimes roll our eyes, but actually more for, for us, at least right now, we're even more grateful to the online forums because, you know, you, there's a lot of conversation out there about, about Slippery Rock and you can, you can look there and see what they say about us and mm -hmm. you can see the value because, you know, I know for a fact that students, that, that parents go on there and say, we went and visited Slippery Rock for a final callback. It was worth it. I'm glad we went, right? It's worth the, the financial investment, I, I, you know, or, or uh, we met with Aaron. Here, here are some of the things that he said, right? Um, that can be very valuable to, to mm -hmm. get that information. But also, you know, the other thing that I would say is that there are thousands of programs out there. They are all wonderful it really is about finding the right match for your kid and trusting in the process. It is, it is a long year. It, it does mm -hmm. go all the way to May 1st and sometimes beyond. We actually had three of our students commit after May 1st this year. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend that. It's stressful on everyone. It, it causes challenges. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, you do, it is a long process. And, and also, almost half of our class committed in the week before May 1st, mm -hmm. right? It's brutal. That feels like more than ever this year. We were just saying with our students, we're going, oh my God, it is, guys, it's, it's, it's May. It's brutal. I mean, some of it where it's fell, it fell on, a, I guess, a weekend. So it felt, those, yeah. that made it a little trickier. But yeah, it was later than, later than most years. We, yeah. we yeah. were sort of like, guys, it's, make they're some decisions. Very frustrating. Very frustrating. And, um, you know, all, all we can do is do our best to look out for the mental health of our, of our children because yeah. it, is, it is a long, grueling process. And, um, you know, I commit to being as transparent and communicative as humanly possible. Ask for what you need and do your best to be communicative back to me. And we can find a way to make this work and to make it better. Because mm -hmm. that's the other thing is that I keep thinking we've got to find ways to make this audition process better. Um, and, and I'm sure that, you know, I already have some ideas about how to do that moving forward. I want to talk to some other universities. I want to talk to some of the folks like you about how to do some of those things. But I can tell you, number one, the number one thing that will help that is if we all communicate a little bit better and we mm -hmm. really, really uh, engage in asking the questions that we need and asking for what we need and giving clarity so that we can all, all work together with that, that point of view. It's so true. It's, uh, you know, we often say there's no union for college prep. There's nobody like sort of being like, Let, who's advocating for the students in this? Even though so many of the professors have the students' best interest in mind, it's so hard to get everybody on the same page to make it uh, a unified, is. transparent process. And so even when it's unintended, sometimes different, you know, rules will rub different schools the wrong way and different deadlines, different procedures. Yep. And then all of a sudden the student's caught in the middle. Well, that's and that's also, but that's also why we are committed to using accepted and using the common app and all of these things. Mm -hmm. We're accepted. We, we're committed to that because we do want to find a way to create, to, to make it accessible and make it mm -hmm. possible for our students not to get overwhelmed um, and to make it um, uh, accessible for students that are disadvantaged in any way that that might be. We want to make mm -hmm. sure that you have access. I love it. All right. Well, if students want to hear more, we know they can be on Instagram at SRU Theater. Um, you guys have a Facebook as well. Is there anywhere else that you'd really want people to be checking out information? Yeah. And I want to point out that it's SRU Theater with an R-E, not hmm, E-R. Spelled wrong. Yep. You guys spelled oh. it wrong. <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes. And we're also on TikTok. 
um, oh, no. at sruththeater dot at theater with an re as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, no, we heard about the way you said it though. There's the re there. <laughs> a little bit of extra pretension out of the re. <laughs> theater, theater, theater. Yeah. Um, yes. So uh, yes, that those are those are great places to look. We did um, a pretty major curriculum overhaul this last year, and some of that is on our website now. It's uh-huh. not completely updated, but by the time this is out in the world, maybe it will be. Yeah. Um, and so you can look at our website as well. Those are probably our best things. But I would also give you. Uh, I'll also give you um, the email that really is the best email to reach out to me, which is uh, BFA Theater, R-E, at S-R-U dot E-D-U. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is where we do all of our recruitment uh, conversations through is through that email address. Right. Um, and I, I would be happy to hear from anybody. We'll, we'll throw it into the show notes as well. And, and I love that. I'm just going to commend having the curriculum on, on the website. Also, it's another great, we'll talk about transparency. Sometimes when schools make you click six times and email somebody, yeah. I'm like, can you put your curriculum on the website? Yeah. Um, so I'm glad that you do that. Uh, Aaron, this was such a joy. Thanks so much for the time today. You're so welcome. Thanks. Thanks. And you know, Maybe in four years when we've, uh, you know, completely overhauled and, uh, you know, progressed from here, we'll do it again. Part two. (laughs) Heck yeah. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Aaron. Some really exciting stuff. And he definitely has his ear to the ground with this process. And I think is a really articulate advocate for his program. In fact, so articulate of an advocate that right after we stopped recording, he had a bunch of things he forgot to say. He had a whole uh, notepad or whatever written down. So I'm going to include them here. I promise that I'd add these in for you, sort of uh, postscript to the episode. Um, he wanted you to know that they do at Slippery Rock four shows each year, two plays, two musicals, and have done eight world premieres, many of which had the playwrights engage with how a play process is developed, and also that freshmen are required to audition, and a huge number of freshmen get on stage their first year. This last year, the freshman class was 100%. Okay, if that's the interview wrapped up, let's do some takeaways. Um, I'll do a short head nod to his great answer about showcase, or kind of the diversity of their capstone experience. Uh, I talked about this a bit in our last college episode with David from Ohio Northern, but I really do think it's important that all of these newer programs have an answer in 2023. What is their strategy, which isn't just a copy of what worked 20 years ago for Carnegie Mellon? Um, I also said it quickly in the episode, but I just love Slippery Rock's way of applying, or you can send in the pre-screen first, get an answer, and then apply to the actual school. That is a great way for BFA programs to do their process. However, unfortunately for our students, it is not the norm in this process. Other schools do do it, but more often than not, you're applying at the same time as your pre-screen submission. Hopefully more and more schools pick up on the way to do this process and save the time and money of an application. If they're going to be picky artistically on a pre-screen, that is the better way to do it. Hopefully they're all listening and that will change um, in years to come. Hopefully if you're listening to this in 2027, it's a different process then. It's always possible. But for my longer takeaways... I really, really like what Aaron said about the ways you represent being you in the room. Um, We talked about this a bit way back in the episode, I think it was six or seven with Mark Madama. And I am resolved to keep pressing teachers to be more specific if they just say, be your authentic self. Because I do think in this case, and in a lot of these cases, it leads to really intelligent and helpful answers. Um, you'll notice that Aaron talked about material selection, which we all know is a huge part of how you represent yourself in the room. Not that it's about what piece you pick or don't pick is going to get you in or not, but what pieces you choose to pick are the representation of how you want to um, articulate yourself in the world, how you want to articulate yourself in this room. But also, I think the idea of stuff like presentness, how present you are, so we meet you and not your planned representative, it's really good advice. And I also love the advice of the small pre-adjustment. That's something that I often say too. So I think it's really good of like, let it be new this time. Don't just try to do play the tape on how it worked last time. Give yourself a slight adjustment so that it comes out a little bit new, which is a little bit risky. It's a little scary, but of course, then we're going to really meet you going through an artistic process and not just you sort of playing the tape. So I co-sponsor all of that as really good food for thought. Um, And the last little takeaway I want to do is just about what Aaron said about transparency. I really like this. And I liked his quote about, you know, transparency is more important than enthusiasm. Or I think he said more important than enthusiasm is transparency. But enthusiasm, we all know, is important. You have to want to be in the room. But here, I think Aaron is talking about another flip side of authenticity in that it can't be a fake bubbliness or a fake excitement of, you're not my number one school. Oh my God, I'm so in love with you. Everything that you do is perfect, right? You know, a school can often sniff out that energy if that's what uh, you're leading with. And transparency is important in human interaction in general, right? We can kind of tell when it feels like someone's being disingenuous. And I think, you know, if you're being transparent, it's a really becoming quality 
to, that you can have in dealing with people. There is the risk that they're going to use that transparency against you if you give information that is too much or maybe unhelpful information that you wish they didn't know. But even in that very risk, you are being authentic and vulnerable, and that can be really endearing, especially to faculty who are also trying to navigate this difficult process with as much integrity as possible. Um, we often, in this process, we hear it again and again in these takeaways, I use the analogy of dating, and I'm going to use it once again. And I would say like the opposite of transparency in dating, and this can happen in the college editions too, would be the idea of like game playing right? Trying to show them a person you think they want to see, you know, what is it? You don't call, call until three days later. What are all the things that you do when you're dating, right? Or maybe you're giving them answers and trying to pretend like you're a kind of person that you think they want to hear about, right? So in the college example, it might be like, I think if they're asking me this question, they want to hear about schools like X, as opposed to just like answering the question honestly, it might actually lead to a more engaging conversation. Whereas just like with dating, I do think it's important to find the level of transparency that is actually comfortable for you. For some, that might not be utter and complete honesty. You know, I love that a student did tell Aaron, you're number three on my list. My God, that's very specific. I probably wouldn't go around telling schools, you're number 15. Hey, I just added you for a little bit of safety school. Like, if that's true, then maybe you can find, while still being authentic and transparent and not saying, hey, you're my number one school, you might be able to find a way to talk about it that isn't quite quite so brutally honest, right? You can find what feels authentic to you, but also protecting yourself with statements like, hey, you're one of my top few options, um, especially we get later in the process, something that people will often say, and it can be really true. If they're your number one, you tell them you're number one. But if you're saying you're my top few, we understand what that means, where you're not necessarily saying like, you're, you're seventh of eight right now on my list or whatever. You wouldn't give necessarily that information. Again, like dating, you know, to be honest and say something like, I'm seeing other people. I think that's necessary if it's your truth. Otherwise, you'd really be disingenuous with a, a partner that you're seeing. But you don't necessarily have to say, I'm seeing five other people and you're my fourth favorite, right? Some people might choose that kind of radical honesty and I think more power to them. But others might find a nice way of honestly saying, hey, I'm really enjoying our time together. I want to keep spending time with you. But I'm also enjoying my time with this other school too or this other person, whichever uh, dating or school analogy we're in at the moment. And especially as we get into stuff like negotiation, Everyone has to find their own level of integrity that they want to navigate that with. Hopefully none of you are out there lying. I think it's really important that you don't lie to schools, but many people will present a version of facts that represent themselves as best as possible. And that is an okay way to approach this process. You know, like the student who gave Aaron the example of, I'm getting 120,000 over there. I'm like, that's a smart student. Aaron coming back and saying, and I'm still twice as cheap as them is also smart on Aaron's part. So everyone's kind of approaching the process I think very well um, in that case. And I think the important advice I'm trying to pull from Aaron here is that you don't have to come in and say, I love you on the first date, if that's not your truth, right? You don't have to be further along than you are in the process. And in fact, especially with a newer program, there's something great about going through it together, have the experience, and then speak from a place of honesty about that experience. And it will likely go better than if you just try to tell them what you think they want to hear. Or if you're operating from a place of fear, like I don't have any acceptances, and going, yes, please, I want you so badly. That might not actually be as exciting to the school than if you're saying, here's where I am. I'm excited to learn more about your school. Let's have this experience together. Okay, that's it. Our penultimate episode before a short six-week break. This one was produced by the outstanding Megan Cordier. And shout out to our podcast intern, Ella Walters, a class of 2023 MTCA student who did a great job helping us out a few of the past episodes and preparing our re-air episodes. She also did some social media stuff for us. She just completed her internship with Flying Colors, and we thank her for her great work. If you want to be an MTCA student and future podcast intern, and you aren't yet either of those things, please check us out at mtcollegeauditions.com. You can also follow the podcast at Mapping the College Audition on Instagram and like and subscribe on your platform of choice so you don't miss a single episode. If you want to rate and review us, I wouldn't be mad at you. You are allowed. Jesse Mueller, I think, would be really sad if you missed her episode. You know, I don't think she has enough fans yet, so I think you really, she really needs you to be there for her and listen next week, okay? So like and subscribe where you can. To my young artists out there mapping their journey, for the love of God, return your darn emails. We'll see you next week. Mapping the